affected by the ocean. Uh, I will probably touch upon things uh, quite in in a perfunctory or a or a surfacial type of manner, but uh, we can have discussions where if we want to go a little bit deeper into one or two things, uh, or people can raise hands and uh, ask a ask a question, and that will allow me. Uh, the possibility of uh, going a little bit deeper uh, than I intend to. So let's see how it goes. So first of all, let us talk about the real estate, you know, what we call as real estate, how much, uh, how much of ocean or how much of the sea uh, belongs to different countries in, uh, in, in the way that we will discuss a little bit later when we talk about the maritime zones, etc. Uh, but let, let's suffice to say that uh, everybody understands what coastline is. So coastline is just simply how much coast your country has. So that's the coastline of your country. And uh, the other concept, which is the exclusive economic zone, which many of you may not have heard of, or many of you may, may have heard of, uh, I don't know. But exclusive economic zone is a concept that was created by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, in 1982. And basically, uh, I, although I'm going to speak a little bit in more details about it uh, in a later session, it suffices to say for now that exclusive economic zone uh, is taken as 200 nautical miles from the low water mark or from, from what we call as the point where the baseline of a country is measured. Uh, a baseline for drawing the coastline and drawing the maritime zones. So uh, EEZ uh, is considered to be 200 nautical miles. Now, obviously, you will wonder that, for example, take the case of India and Sri Lanka. We don't have 200 miles between India and Sri Lanka. So what do you do there? So what, what you do there is then you draw an equidistance line at various points between India and Sri Lanka, and then you divide that into in a, in a what we know what we call in law as not equal but equitable distribution now this is a complicated subject so let's 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 uh, for, for sake of uh, argument uh, equal is not equitable or vice versa equitable is not equal but in general uh, equitable will take into account a range of other factors to divide the area in a manner that is beneficial to both parties. So that's that's the principle. It may or may not always work that way. Because if you do, if you divide things equally, then that also sometimes can create uh, inequities. Uh, for example, let me just give a simple example that let's say we have 20 people in this group now. And uh, if I have 100 pounds to give to 20 people, uh, I will give five pounds equally distributed. It will come, up, come out to five pounds per, per person. But then that is not equitable because some people may deserve the money more than some others. Or some people might need the money more than some others. So you might distribute the money in such a way that some people get 10 pounds, some people get nothing, some people get two pounds, some people get seven pounds, and so on. And that is called as equitable distribution. So... Equitable in law, uh, uh, equitable is defined as anything but equal. Okay, so that's let's put it that way. So that is how the EEZs are demarcated uh, between countries if they are what we call as uh, adjoining countries or adjacent countries, neighboring countries. So just like say we have we have Bangladesh on the one side, which is an adjoining country, or Pakistan on the other side, which is an adjoining country, and uh, Sri Lanka would be considered to be. Uh, a, a neighboring country or opposite country. So that's one of the uh, ways in which this is uh, dealt with. So anyway, coming back to the coastline. So coastline is a simple concept. You simply measure the length of the coast uh, that we have uh, for a particular country. And you will see now here, uh, we know very well that uh, Canada is quite a large country by, by land area also. Uh, but Russia, as you know, uh, is the largest country uh, in terms of the land mass, land size that it has, it has, but Russia is way down. If you see on the list here, Russia is fifth on the list. On the other hand, uh, Canada is number one, and Norway, which, which, if you see the map, uh, Norway is surprisingly small, but it's number two 
on the list of the coastline. Now you might wonder why this is so. And this is because what is known as a bound is coastline paradox. It's called coastline paradox. And that is the unit that you take to measure the coastline. So if you take, for example, a hundred kilometer unit, then the coastline will be X amount, let's say. And if you make that into a 50 kilometer unit or 20 kilometer unit or 10 kilometer unit, then the coastline will keep on increasing. Now, Norway has used that principle of using a smaller unit of measuring the coastline. That's number one. But more importantly, Norway has got uh, a, a jagged, what you call as a jagged coastline. So it's not a straight coastline or it's not a uh, curved coastline, but it is jagged. That means it has got very sharp edges. You know, it, it's very, it has got a number of sharp edges. So if you basically go, go each, each, you start from one end and rather than going straight down the coastline, if you look at, if you go along all the jagged edges like that, then you can imagine that your coastline is going to be multiplied several times. And that's probably one of the reasons why Norway seems to have this very large coastline. Indonesia is another interesting example uh, because Indonesia is uh, full of islands because Indo Indonesia consists of literally thousands of islands. So if you take the, if you take the coastline around each of the island and add it up, then that becomes the you know, coastline of Indonesia. And which is why Indonesia is quite significant too. Now, the other surprising one here is Denmark, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is a tiny country in Europe, uh, but it's got, it's number four. That's because it's got this island called Greenland, which belongs to them. So of course, if you then take the coastline of Greenland, then it becomes quite big. So that's why the Denmark features in there and so on. And USA, which you would expect to be much larger in, in this in these terms here, it is not. That's because uh, USA has got only east and west coastline and nothing to the north and nothing to the south, because Mexico to the south and Canada to the north. So that's where it is. Uh, Australia, again, it's, it's, it's an it's a island continent. It's a continent which is by itself uh, and it's got one or two little islands like Hobart, Tasman, Tas Tasmania and so on. So all that will, will add up to it. New Zealand is another interesting case, although a tiny country, but it's got not the North Island, the South Island, and some other tiny islands. So if you add them up all up, then that's what you get. Uh, India, as you can see here, is number 18. So these are the top 10. The list is top 10. And India is the 10th coastline, and it is 7,517, which is a significant amount of coastline uh, that we have. And uh, so that's the real estate. And, but more importantly, real estate in terms of the area of the, of the maritime area or the area of the ocean, you would see surprising. Another surprise here is France, if you see the EEZ. And France has got an EEZ of almost 11 million square kilometers, which is huge, which is bigger even than the USA. Uh, and that is uh, because France has got what we call as uh, offshore islands, which belong to them. So there's saint Pierre and Michelin and so on. So France has got a number of offshore islands. So all those islands create also a EZ. And the, and the peculiarity of, uh, of, an, of an island is even if you have a tiniest of island, it, it has a, uh, the EZ of it will have a 200 square, uh, 200 nautical mile uh, rad radius or 400, nautical miles diameter, even if it is a tiny island. So that adds to the size of the exclusive economic zone. So France has got this huge exclusive economic zone, largest in the world, uh, as a result of its offshore islands, the number of offshore islands. The same is the case with USA, for example, because USA has got the mainland, but it's got a number of offshore islands in the, in the, in, in, in the Pacific, including what we call as the Hawaii group of islands. So all those things. Um, Australia, again, same thing. It's an it's a, it's a island continent, and it's got free place to create the exclusive economic zone. So all around Australia, you can have this huge, big exclusive economic zone, and so on. Russia, of course, sadly, has only got the northern bit and a bit in the east, uh, and not a lot otherwise, because it's, it's surrounded by other countries on the east, on the west and south and part of the east also. So, and so on. 
Uh, Canada, which had the longest coastline there, uh, ends up being number uh, seven or something, number, yeah, number seven uh, in the list. Uh, Japan, for example, which is again, relatively small, has got a huge amount of coastline. New Zealand's, uh, sorry, uh, uh, of EZ, and so has uh, uh, New Zealand. And Brazil, which is such a huge country, uh, only has, uh, uh, you know, the, the sea on the, on, the, on the Atlantic side and uh, uh, no other opening because the other side is completely the west, west of Brazil is uh, landlocked. So, so as a result of that, you have uh, relatively small coastline, but it's a huge country. India, uh, again, is at number 18. Just a coincidence that both coastline of India and the uh, and the EEZ, the exclusive economic zone of India, are both uh, uh, that number eighteen. And India has got a EEZ of two point three million uh, square kilometers. And that compares, if you if you look at the uh, land area of India, uh, it is three point two square um, million square kilometers. So 3.2 million square kilometers is our land area. And this is uh, uh, your uh, exclusive economic zone or the ocean real, real estate that India has. Um, and there is another concept which I want to introduce at this point, but which we'll talk about uh, in late greater details when I talk about maritime zones, is the concept of continental shelf. Now, those of you who have studied geology will know that continental shelf is a geological term, but the law of the sea has picked up that term and made it into a legal entity and a legal uh, maritime zone. And what it says, to put it simply, is that whatever is the EZ, whatever is the outermost extent of your EZ, if you draw a vertical line from there to hit the seabed, then what you get on the seabed will be called as your continental shelf. Okay, which is different than the definition of the continental shelf in geology and geophysics and uh, geography. So anyway, so if you just take a vertical line at from the outermost extent of the exclusive economic zone and take a plumb line and drop it straight to the ocean floor, then that's your, ex uh, that's your continental shelf. Now, India, of course, has got obviously, because of 2.3 uh, square, uh, million square kilometers of EZ, it's got also a huge continental shelf. So that means the seabed also belongs to, to India. But... There's another provision in the law of the sea, which is rather complicated, which again we'll talk about when we talk about maritime zones, is that you can, you can claim for extended coastline. And you can claim for extended coastline, and that way India has, and there are, there are provisions for that, which we'll come to uh, later on. Because of that, India is able to claim almost another, another three quarters of a million square kilometers of continental shelf as its own. So really, if you add the, uh, the, the continental shelf uh, that belongs to India and add the continental shelf that India has claimed in addition to the, what, what it has, then the land area of India is almost similar to the, to the seabed area that India has claim on. So this is quite, uh, uh, quite a significant chunk of uh, uh, real estate that India has. So, okay, so this is a map basically showing the exclusive economic zones of the world. Uh, so you can see uh, that continental countries have got their exclusive economic zones uh, around them. Uh, you see a very busy patch there. Uh, in in this in the south in Southeast Asia around Australia, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, etc. So that's a busy patch because of the number of islands there. Uh, New Zealand to the far, uh, what you call as far uh, southwest, as it were, if you if you can see, uh, and that's got a significant uh, uh, what you call as exclusive economic zone. And then you will see these circles, yeah. circles in the middle of the ocean. Uh, you will see these circles in the middle of the ocean, which again uh, represent the, 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 the exclusive economic yeah. zone uh, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, please, can I request everybody to switch off their microphones? Thank you. Unless they want to ask a question. Thank you. Um, 
And India, you can see because of our, uh, the islands that we have, uh, Lakshadweep and so on, uh, we have an extended coast uh, exclusive economic zone that you can see uh, dropping off from India vertically downwards. But then, of course, there is other other place, other island that is there, which is the Maldives, which is our closest maritime neighbor uh, in terms of uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the Indian Ocean. And again, you see another busy patch there uh, to the, um, to the uh, west here. And these are the, what we call as the islands uh, in the Pacific, uh, many of who, which belong to the US, but some belong to France, as I mentioned to you. Again, as a result of which France has got uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, real estate there in the ocean. So that is uh, uh, reasonably clear, I hope. Uh, so then this is, a, this is a list I have actually prepared. And I, I, I hope, I mean, I, I, I believe and I trust that this is a quite an exhaustive list of uses and resources of the ocean. And I again use these two terms uh, quite uh, un, uh, quite advisedly, uh, uses and resources, uh, where resources, uh, I mean, in my mind, I mean, this is, again, correct me if I'm wrong, resources give an implication that there is something that you take out, okay, that is, that is a resource. For example, there is fish, and you take it out, and that becomes a resource, and you, you use it, or there is... Uh, there is minerals, for example, uh, uh, and you take them out from where they are and use them somewhere else. So that is the concept of resources, according to me. But there is other one, which is uses. For example, if a ship goes through the water, okay, so it is water is providing it a navigation channel, a, a, a place to go from A to B, but it is not taking away anything, okay. So that would become uses, that would become a use. For example, if you are, um, you know, if the ocean is helping us control the climate, which I mentioned later on, uh, that will uh, be a use of the ocean or learning from the ocean, marine scientific research or education. So that would be use of the ocean. So that's a, or even leisure and tourism to, to a great extent is something, a use of the ocean, not a, not a resource. So when, when there is leisure and tourism, you're not taking away anything. Ideally, I mean, of course, when you when you have leisure and tourism, the problem is that excessive leisure and tourism uh, causes the damage. One of the things they say about uh, leisure and tourism is the, is the success of leisure and tourism is the very cause of its failure. Because what happens is when you when you when you go to some place for the first time, some some human being goes to some uh, you know uh, unvisited island or something like that. For the first time, they think, "Wow, this is a fantastic place, and let me let me build a hotel there, or let me have an airport or something." And then millions of people start coming there, and the very reason for which this first person found it fascinating is gone because then it becomes like any other place. So again, leisure and tourism uh, is, is is a contradiction because the more successful it is, uh, the 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 greater success it is, the more uh, counterproductive it becomes because it is it is causing obviously the reverse uh, uh, reverse reaction as it were uh, than to what it was planned for. But anyway, so so shipping and navigation. So that's the prime use. I mean, some people say that that is the first use of the ocean. Uh, some people might argue with it. Um, people might say fishing might be the first um, use of the ocean or resource of the ocean that has been exploited. But anyway, let's leave the debate aside. But shipping and navigation is a very important um, aspect of um, uh, marine use and marine resource. Uh, and as I've said, because 95% of all the trade uh, in the world is carried by sea, uh, submarine cables, 98% of all our electronic communication is carried by submarine cables, and so on and so forth. So, so it is shipping and navigation is a hugely important subject as far as uh, uses and resources of the sea are concerned. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the seas are known as the highways of Neptune. Neptune being the lord or the god of the nether world. You know, Neptune is the, in, in, the West, in Western mythology, um, Neptune is the god of the ocean. So for example, when, when I crossed the equator for the first time back in the 19, uh, mid 1980s, uh, when I was on a research vessel, uh, then the captain uh, personally uh, signed a certificate saying that 
uh, I had crossed the equator and paid my obeisance to Lord Neptune. And the obeisance to Lord Neptune was by, by way of symbolically drinking a pint of seawater. Of course, you know, you can't drink a pint of seawater and live, but uh, uh, you just take a sort of, a, you know, just a token sip from the, uh, from the large uh, beer glass of one pint, and then uh, you have paid the obeisance to Lord Neptune. Anyway, so, so that's shipping and navigation. So going from A to B, so that's, uh, that's shipping and navigation. But then you have what you call as ports and harbors. So that those are the A's and B's. So ports and harbors are the A and B's. So we have to have A and B for in order for ships to go to A and B or C and D. Uh, then living resources, all sorts of living resources. I mean, the ocean has got marine mammals, with huge whales and so on. Uh, it's got the sharks and it's got other fish. And it's got, the as we saw, we saw plankton is very importantly it's got plankton uh, and it's of course got the nekton which swims and benthos which is on the floor and all of those are what we call as living resources now all not all those living resources are our food but they are part of what we call as a food chain a food web i should say because it's not a chain it's not a singular thing it's a web it's a complicated web of food and that's what living resources are and then you have uh, non-living resources. Now, non-living resources include minerals and include the very, uh, very simple, what you call as sand and gravel. Actually, sand and gravel is to be the largest. You'll be surprised. Sand and gravel is, you know, the you know, construction material that you use for construction. Uh, and sand and gravel is very cheap. I mean, you, you know, comparatively compared to, let's say, uh, placer deposits of gold or tin or cassiterite or manganese or whatever, iron or anything like that. But the, the quantity you know, because obviously our our uh, our building, you know, the construction industry is insatiable. So the amount of uh, sand and gravel that was mined at one time actually was the biggest. It was the biggest industry, the biggest ocean industry after before oil and gas, for example, took over, and uh, of course, laterly uh, leisure and tourism, particularly uh, marine and uh, ocean tourism. <clears throat> Then, of course, strategic uses. Strategic uses means these are uses related to your strategy, your maritime strategy, and that is related to your naval uses, really. Uh, that means military uses. That, that, that would be the broad term for that. And, of course, uh, the Law of the Sea Convention deals a little bit with uh, military uh, activities and a little bit with strategic uses, but the focus is more on what we call as civilian use. So that's what my focus would be too. But we would nevertheless talk about strategic uses because a lot of these strategic uses also create opportunities and create inventions and create discoveries. In fact, a lot of these uh, uh, the, the things that we know about the world, a lot of these have happened as a result of the strategic developments in, in the area of arms and manufacturing and technology and, uh, uh, and military uses and so on and so forth. And then I, be, I mentioned uh, cables and pipelines, you know, oil and gas pipelines uh, are quite common and cables, as we said, uh, you know, most of our communication is happening through, through the cables. Waste disposal, another huge important use, use again, you know, because you're not taking out any, in fact, putting junk in it, you know. So waste disposal is another one, another su such, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, another such uh, uh, use that we have. Uh, and 80%, and we'll come back to that a little bit later, but something like 80% or more of all the waste that we produce on land ends up in the ocean. That's, now that's, that's a grotesque thing, and that's also a very worrying thing, but that is what we are doing currently and forever. We've been putting 80% of all our, sorry, 80% of all the waste that ends up in the ocean comes from the land. So in fact, all of it, most of what we produce ends up in, in the sea. And of course, the other 20% is also coming from land, but it's not coming directly. That's why we don't count it, but we'll come back to that later. <clears throat> And then you have the control of climate. We ocean ocean is known as uh, global air conditioner. Okay, so in fact, I should have said similar to highways of Neptune um, or um, uh, mines of Neptune. Yeah, living resources are called mines of Neptune. You know, mine mining. You know, from the point of that. So they're mines of Neptune. Waste disposal is we, we are it, ocean is a global dustbin. 
the ocean is a global dustbin. You know, that's what it is. It's, it's like our dustbin that we use at home, but this is a huge one. You're throwing everything in it. And then, of course, climate control. So it's a global air conditioner. It is the ocean that allows the earth to be livable. Okay, it is a presence of water. Now, I just give you very, very quick examples. If you go to the moon, I mean, well, people that have gone to the moon will tell you that it's very hot during the day and it's very cold during the night. Okay, that's because there is no presence of water. And that's true, not just on the moon, but if you go to deserts, if you go to Sahara, if you go to uh, uh, African Sahara, or if you go to the Arabian desert, or if you go to Gobi desert, or why not, if you just go to our deserts in Rajasthan, you know, you will find that daytime is extremely hot, scorching hot, but night times are extremely cold because there is no presence of water. It's the water that moderates your climate. Uh, <clears throat> so control of climate. So this is something, a free gift. The ocean is giving this free gift to us by controlling our weather and making sure that we have in this temperate or in this tropical region, in this temperature range of, you know, minus whatever, 10, 15, 20 degrees to plus 34, 35, or plus 40 degrees, or in India, some places, things go up to plus 50 degrees or whatever. But those are at least reasonably living conditions. If the water wasn't present, we could have temperatures which were exceedingly hot and exceedingly cold. So that is what it is. So that's another in, in important use. Then I put marine scientific research and education, what, what you and I are doing now. Education, learning about the ocean, learning from the ocean, and learning what to do, how to deal with the uh, problems that we face with the ocean. So that's very important. And marine scientific research gives us a clue to that. Um, MGRs are marine genetic resources. And these are resources that we didn't know of. You know, I'll come back to those later again. But uh, as I mentioned to you last week, uh, yesterday, um, when I was un an undergraduate student, these, these were discovered for the first time, this whole idea of something else is happening in the ocean other than photosynthesis, which is happening on land and much of the ocean of, of uh, sustaining life. Uh, this is a new way of sustaining life, and that was chemosynthesis, and that was happening in the ocean, and that was creating this new species that we never knew about until 1975. It was 75 that these were discovered for the first time. So imagine our our knowledge of ocean is so limited, as I mentioned before. And then again, that leads to fantastic possibilities in terms of biotechnology, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, pharmacology, in terms of finding solutions and finding cures for incurable diseases that we have, perhaps things like cancer or AIDS or whatever. You know? So all those things can be, uh, the cures for those can be found, in fact, are being found as we speak through this marine genetic resources and the biotechnology that can be developed out of it. And then of course, people are thinking of human habitat. Already we know that uh, countries like the United Arab Emirates have made, created this uh, you know, farm islands, et cetera, creating artificial islands and so on. Uh, already uh, almost, I mean, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, well, at least hundreds of thousands of people live on offshore rigs, offshore oil and gas rigs, permanently, almost semi-permanently there. They have this rota called two week on, two week off, and they uh, they go back and forth, but they have a full, like a hotel uh, offshore structure where people actually live there day in and day out. Uh, and of course, ocean uh, helps us achieve conservation. The natural processes, I told you about biogeochemical fluxes, and those again help uh, the conservation of the, of, you know, the environment preservation and protection of the environment. And of course, uh, refugee heaven, you know, it's a heaven for refugees. The ocean is a refugee. You've you heard these very sad stories about boat, uh, refugee boats uh, and, uh, you know, people migrating from one, one part of the world, unfortunate parts of the world to the supposedly fortunate parts of the world in tiny boats, in dinghies, in little motor boats and stuff like that. So it's a heaven for refugees. But also, uh, it's a it's a, it's a veritable place place for illicit and illegal uses. So, trade illegal trade in drugs, in illegal trade in arms, human trafficking, all sorts of things. You know, all those things happen 
uh, uh, as a result of the proximity to ocean. So all those things, as we call as our ocean uh, uses and resources of the ocean, uh, I, have, I, have, I think in my mind that this is a, as exhaustive a list as can get. Uh, but if you think of one or two things that you want to add to it, uh, please tell me and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to discuss as to how they don't fit in there or they fit in there, so they're already there or if they're not there, then I will probably uh, change that list and modify my, my talk. Uh, so, so first, I mean, let's talk about, well, no, I'm not going to talk about each one in some, any details, but let's talk about some of them in some details, if, as much as we can, as much as the time permits. Um, so, uh, shipping and navigation, this is controlled uh, worldwide, uh, at least uh, in our world, uh, obviously, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a democratic world or in a, uh, in a United Nations uh, sense of the world and uh, this is controlled by the UN and uh, UN organization called the International Maritime Organization. It's one of the few organizations that is based outside uh, Switzerland and uh, U United States rather the other way around United States and Switzerland. Um, so uh, it is one of the very few organizations that is based outside of those two countries uh, and this is um, uh, in based in London in England uh, in the U United Kingdom. And the other prominent organization that I can think of that is based out of, uh, out of, uh, out of United States or Switzerland um, or, or Austria, in fact, that's another country that has got some UN organizations, um, is, is Kenya, where the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, is based, which is what we are most related to. So that's another organization that um, we, we can think of as outside these few countries. Anyway. Uh, of course, there are any number of other countries also that have got UN organizations, Canada has got one, a few, uh, Germany's got a few and so on. Anyway, uh, Jamaica has got one and so on. Okay, but anyway, so the, uh, so the organization that regulates this, regulates not regulated, regulates this globally is the United Nations International Maritime Organization, which is based in London. Now, the number of ships registered globally, uh, now, Again, people will say, what is a ship? When does a ship become a ship? And when is, it, when is a boat a boat? So one of the sort of uh, clever uh, cliches is that uh, a ship can carry a boat, but a boat can't carry a ship. So that's, that's either here nor there. So it doesn't make any sense. But in general, a ship is understood to be 500 tons gross registered, you know, tonnage of, uh, you know, uh, gross registered tonnage of 500 tons is considered to be a ship, anything bigger than that. But of course, you have you have ships that are half a million tons, you know, these huge oil tankers. Uh, they can be up to, you know, they can be you know, almost a kilometer long and uh, up to um, half a million tons or so. They're called ultra-large crew carriers, ULCCs. Let's talk about VLCCs, very large crew carriers. These are ultra-large crew, crew carriers. But anyway, number of ships registered globally uh, is 62,000, 62,000. But you see the numbers in India, only 1,500. So literally, I mean, Indian shipping is very, very poor in terms of the total number of ships. And as you see, the ships can be 500 tons onwards. So India has got 1,500 ships, which are 500 tons onwards, which is not a lot compared to 62,000 around the world. Gross registered tonnage uh, globally, again, is 2 million tons, 2 million tons, but sorry, 2 billion, I'm sorry, that's 2,000 million tons. So that's 2 billion tons. Uh, India's gross registered tonnage is only 13 million tons. So that's again, a tiny fraction of the total amount. So there's, there's a lot more India could do in terms of seafaring and in terms of uh, uh, growing a merchant navy. A merchant navy. Uh, India has endowed, as I said, with 7,500 7, kilometers of coastline. Uh, but we've not been, and some people might disagree with me, but if you read the history, we've not been a, we've not been a maritime nation. That means, in a sense, we have not gone with our ships outside. The other people have come to us. So we have had people coming from all over the world. In fact, it, it was, was one of the jewels in the crown of many, many uh, old superpowers, including the United Kingdom. Right? But all those countries, you know, the Dutch have come, the Portuguese have come, the Spaniards have come, and so on. Or, or even the people from Middle East have come to India for trade and for, 
for wars or for looting or whatever purpose it is. But we have not gone out. Our, our, uh, our seaworthiness has not been uh, <coughs> prolific, as it were. Uh, total emissions. Now, this is, this is very important because, I, as I've said to you before, that 95% of all the world's trade is carried by the sea. So given that, there's only 25 to 3% of the entire global greenhouse gas emission comes from the ships. So that's not a, that's not a huge amount. <coughs> but that's not a huge amount, but it is still quite significant. And the shipping industry is trying its best through the regulations provided by the International Maritime Organization. It's trying its best to bring down this percentage even lower. So they are a conscious industry and they, they have, not conscious, they, are, they have an industry with a conscience as it were, and they are trying to reduce their global greenhouse gas emissions footprint even lower. Of course, shipping transports 10 billion tons of goods annually. So that's the total tonnage that is ferried around, as it were, across the ocean. Okay. So, ports and harbors. So, top 10 ports. Now, this is, this is another eye-opener. Uh, top 10 ports uh, in the world are all in China, would you believe? So, if you take all the, all the biggest ports in the world, top 10 ports in the world are all in China, except with, with the exception of three. That means seven of 10 are all in China, Singapore, Busan in South Korea, and Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So these are the only three ports that are in the first 10. And they're at number two, number six, and number 10. India has only two ports in the top 50. Top 50 in the world, we have only two ports. JNPT, the Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust in Mumbai, or uh, Nawashiva and it is at 35, and Mudra at 39. So these are only two ports that are in the top 50. India has 12 designated, major designated ports, okay? Major designated. So these are, see, you have to designate your port, just like you, you designate your airport as an international airport. So that means international flights may come and go. Similarly, you have to designate your ports as major ports, which are the ones that are because they, they provide the facilities of customs and immigration. That's the most important thing, apart from many other things. But the most important thing that they do is they can regulate who is coming in and who is going out. And that's why you have to designate, just as you designate your airports as international or domestic. Similarly, the ports have to be designated as international and domestic. And you may not, you may not a foreign national, a foreign vessel may not go to a domestic port and, and try to do business there or try to do something there. They will have to go to an international port because that is where the facility for doing all those things are there, immigration, customs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Security checks, whatever you like to call that. <clears throat> so India has 12 major designated ports, but look at this again. Again, another big eye opener. So how, how, how small we are in compared to the rest of the world uh, or even a country like Singapore that the total tonnage handled by all of the ports, all the 12 ports of India is significantly less than that handled by Singapore alone. And Singapore is a second port. So, so Singapore alone handles the, uh, the tonnage, combined tonnage of all the 12 major ports of India. Now, uh, the government recently has announced six new major ports. Uh, you, you have probably heard that uh, uh, Adani is the, one of the big sort of uh, persons developing ports and airports as well. So six new major ports have been announced by the Shipping Ministry of India under the Sagar Mala project. The Sagar Mala project is a project that is trying to connect. So there's something called as uh, Bharat Mala project, which is the, you know, guard landing of the rivers, connecting the rivers. And Sagar Mala project is connecting all the ports. Okay, connecting all the ports, but not just ports, connecting the ports with the land also. That means this, the, 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 the rivers will be connected to the ports, the highways or what we call as expressways will be connected to the ports and the ports will be connected with each other. So that's what is the whole Sagar Mala 
mala being a chain or a uh, necklace or whatever that you call it. So it's a kind of a garland around the earth, a garland around our, our country. Right, so. So those are the busiest ports in the world and you can see there uh, Shanghai uh, as the biggest and then you have uh, Singapore, which is not in China, but then the next two are in China, then Busan in South Korea, then again Hong Kong, um, Guangzhou and uh, Qingdao again in uh, China. And then at the 11th place, I think, or wherever, uh, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, so there's UAE uh, uh, at the ninth position. So, so we have we have these three. Sorry, what did I say before? Then let me see. Have I said something wrong? Yeah, I think there's some num numbering problem there. But uh, yeah, they they're more or less in that in that position there. Um, so you have Rotterdam uh, just after that. So this is maybe a, from a different year, but whatever. Those are more or less the numbers there. So so you can see the twenty world's busy. Oh, this is sorry. This is this is not the overall ports. This is a yeah. Now now it makes sense why it is the way it is. These are the 10, 10 of the twenty busiest container ports in the world. In world are in China. So this is container ports only. This is not overall ports, but. So the figure before is correct from that point of view, and this one is correct from the other point of view. So these are the major ports in India. Uh, so India has got, if you can see, going from uh, east to west, you've got uh, east-southwest. So you've got Kolkata, Paradip. Paradip. So Kolkata is in um, West Bengal, Paradip in, uh, in Orissa. Then you have Vishakhapatnam. Uh, then you have Enor uh, and Chennai, these two in Tamil Nadu, and of course uh, also Chidambaram. Um, uh, so that, that that's uh, three in, uh, in 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 Tamil Nadu, and then you have uh, Cochin in uh, in Kerala. Then you have New Mangalore, which is in Karnataka, and then you have Marmugao, which is in Goa, in JNPT uh, in near Bombay and Mumbai port, and then of course the Dindayal Upadhyaya port in in Gujarat. So you have. These are the 12 major ports of India. And like I said, uh, they do less business than a single Singapore. Okay, So that uh, sort of puts it in perspective. <clears throat> so there's, there's so much more uh, that, that India could do in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of expanding uh, its uh, maritime prowess, particularly uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the near future. Now, this is uh, uh, jumping from shipping and navigation to living resources now. <clears throat> so shipping and navigation and ports and harbors we have talked about. So we come to now living resources. And this is a map of the world showing what is known as the large marine ecosystems. Again, uh, this map sort of, sort of, I'm not saying it does, but sort of corresponds with the map that you've seen of the exclusive economic zone. So this is kind of uh, the large marine ecosystems superimposed on what we call as the areas within the national jurisdiction. You will hear me say two things, areas within the national jurisdiction, which is the exclusive economic zone or the continental shelf, and areas beyond national, national, national jurisdiction, which is area that is outside the exclusive economic zone or outside the continental shelf. So. Again, that's that's another topic we'll talk about later on. The areas outside the national jurisdiction are in the in the water, they are called the high seas, and on the ground, on the seabed, they are called international seabed area. So high seas and international seabed area. So that's a distinction uh, you will need to take into account. So in the national jurisdiction, you have the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf. In the international, in, in the in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, you have the high seas in the water column, and in the seabed, you, you call it uh, international seabed area, which is controlled by a United Nations body called International Seabed Authority, based in Jamaica, in <clears throat> based in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica. So you can see now uh, these large marine ecosystems is a is a convenience. It's it's a it's a map. Uh, that has been divided by the uh, by the various committees, particularly of the Convention on Biodiversity and other envi multilateral environmental conventions, to better manage 
the resources of the ocean. And so these large marine ecosystems are the ones which have their own specialities, their own special uh, types of fish in there, uh, the, the, the various food webs within the um, maritime system and so on. And you can see here that uh, on either side of India, we have two fairly large marine ecosystems, number 32 and number 34. You can see like, on the, in the Bay of Bengal, you have number 34. And in the Arabian Sea, you have number 32. So those are, those are significant, what we call as marine, uh, marine ecosystems. And that is where life is thriving, but that is also where life is being captured you know, in, a, in a significant manner. That means in terms of fisheries and so on, or, and of course damaged because of pollution, because most of the pollution ends up in the coastal zone and into the near shore, into this where exactly where there's more of fish. So basically it's a, it's a double whammy on the other hand, on the one hand, you are catching too many fish from these zones, from these large marine ecosystems and uh, damaging the marine ecosystems by doing that, because you're taking also, I'll come back to that, you're taking bycatch and so on. So, so that, that creates a problem. But on the other hand, it is also creating a problem because you're putting pollutants inside, which are again, damaging the ecosystem. So there's a double whammy there. There's a double, <clears throat> double trouble, as it were. <clears throat> so if you categorize now, all these large marine ecosystems will have different types of living organisms. Now, we of course talk in terms of species that are of commercial importance to us, okay? Uh, we, I mean, we're not, we're not talking about the planktons, for example. We're not talking about the krill, for example. You know, uh, well, krill, people are talking about because now instead of uh, the whales eating the krill uh, in huge quantities, now people are mining, uh, pe not mining, but people are, you know, catching krill. Krill are small, like, you know, they're, they're like, Shins. yeah. So, so they're, they're, they're like um, little tiny mi microscopic, um, uh, not microscopic, two, two to five centimeters length. So the krill, krill are in abundance in the Southern Ocean. And that's, that's the main food of uh, the whales. But this is being uh, affected uh, by uh, commercial fishing now, slowly. And that's not, not, to, um, not necessarily to directly eat it because they're too, too tiny to eat. Um, uh, but um, they, they, uh, they, they can be made into something else. They can be made into animal feed or they can be made into uh, other processed food. So anyway, so... Um, so there we have these species and I've just taken some major ones here, some significant ones. And I've just given one or two examples of uh, each one of uh, those species. So you have what we call as uh, anadromous species. So these are uh, typically anadromous uh, means that the fish live for most of their life uh, in fresh uh, in seawater. Uh, for example, uh, salmon and bass, they, they live most of their life in seawater, but when they want to, when they, uh, they come to breed, they come to, breed in fresh water. So they come back and you might have heard these, seen these fantastic movies about salmons making their way back into the river, swimming upstream, going up even uh, waterfalls and stuff like that. You might have seen that or they even, if, if there's an artificial thing, something, then they try to go into pipes and go into the river and so on. You know, so, so, so you might have seen that. So salmon and bass, uh, sea bass as they're called, uh, they are good examples of anadromous fish. So they live in the sea for the most of their life. And when they want to, when they, when the breeding season comes, they go back to their birthplace, right? <clears throat> then there are benthic. Benthic again, the word remember benthic, benthos. Benthos is at the bottom. Uh, necton, plankton, necton, and benthos. So, so benthos, benthic, benthic fish are people are bottom dwellers. So these are halibut and turbots. Um, now there's there's a thing about bottom dwelling fish because what happens there is the bottom is where all the Rubbish is sinking, you know, heavy metal pollution, all other, other pollutants, they are so sinking there. So the problem with these benthic fish is they are the ones that are ingesting that, you know. So that's, that, uh, that is the problem with these benthic fish. Then opposite to anadromous, you have something called catadroma. I put this in an alphabetical order. Uh, so it's a bit uh, odd. But anyway, the op opposite of the anadromous fish is the catadromous fish. And that is the other way around. So... Anadromous lives in the sea and breeds in the freshwater. This one is the other way around. It lives in freshwater, breeds in the sea. 
Uh, so the eel, for example, is a classic example of uh, catadromous fish. Again, a commercial fish. E eel is a commercial fishery. Uh, Halibut turbot, of course, are commercial fish. Then demersal fish. Again, demersal is again uh, which are which are at depth, uh, and these are sole and place. Uh, so again, uh, another thing. Now, highly migratory species. Now, these species can be could be traveling tens of thousands of kilometers in a year. Typically, all tunas, all tunas are considered to be highly migratory fish. So they migrate across the ocean. They migrate from deep uh, in the vertical column. Also, they migrate from they migrate both vertically and horizontally. So. Uh, altitudinally and latitudinally, whatever you like to call that, you know. So highly migratory species, tuna is one good example, sharks, most sharks are also highly migratory species. Then you have what you call as marine mammals. Marine mammals uh, are, uh, you know, mammals that, that swim, or they, they may not necessarily swim like fish, but they look like, they, sometimes some of them look like fish, but they are mammals such as cetaceans, which is common cetaceans as they are called, whales and dolphins. Pinnipeds. Pinnipeds are the ones that don't have proper feet, but they have sort of webbed feet. And those are seals and walruses. You've seen those very nice uh, uh, sort of video clips probably in ocean programs where you see seals performing tricks and stuff like that. Not, not recommended, but that's what they, they do. Then sirenians, such as manatees and dungongs, uh, dugongs. So those are known as sirenians. And fissipeds, such as polar bears and sea otter. So they, they are, uh, they, they can live both on land and, uh, well, they can live on firm, terra, terra firma and also in the water. Uh, then you have got what you call as pelagic fish. Pelagic, as you, as you remember, if you see from last, last yesterday's talk, pelagic is the surface water. That's where the, that's where the uh, photic effect, the, the light is penetrating and all of it is run by uh, photosynthesis. So, Pelagic fish are generally these uh, herrings and mackerels. Um, herrings and mackerels are uh, typically uh, pelagic fish. Sedentary species. So sedentary are you know the ones that live in contact with the seafloor. You know so they are in contact. So again they have the same problem of ingesting pollutants. So heavy amounts of heavy metal pollutants etc. So crabs and oysters, uh, mussels. You know th those will be com coming under that category of of uh, sedentary fish. And then. Uh, Straddling stock, so stock that moves. I mean, they, they're like migra highly migratory species too. But straddling stocks don't uh, don't migrate all that much. But they migrate between one zone, for example, one large marine ecosystem to the other, uh, or one exclusive economic zone to the other. So obviously, I, 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 for example, there is there is a certain uh, straddling stock of fish in the Indian waters, it may be in Indian waters tomorrow, and it may be in, uh, in uh, Malaysian waters the, the day after tomorrow, or it might be in Pakistani waters, or it might be in Bangladeshi waters. So, so that becomes a little bit of a problem. In fact, as a result of that, there is a special convention that was enacted in 1995 uh, by the United Nations at the sister convention to the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea in 1982. And that is called the Straddling Stocks Convention. It's got a long name. But the short name is Straddling Stocks Convention. Okay. So now, again, if you see where we are in terms of fisheries and aquaculture, so China has got this whopping uh, 76 million tons of fish production. That, and when we talk of fisheries and aquaculture separately, fisheries means capture fisheries. That means you go out and capture the fish into the sea. And aquaculture is the one that you grow around in the coastal zones, uh, in, uh, in intertidal zones and so on. And aquaculture is like agriculture in water uh, or mariculture. Some people call it mariculture. Aquaculture being a broad term to include uh, uh, sweet water or fresh water and seawater and brackish water. All of that combined uh, is aquaculture. So mariculture would be mainly in the sea. But let's say aquaculture is a broad term which, is, which includes fresh water, uh, brackish water, brackish water is in between fresh water and seawater, and seawater. All of that where you do, well, marine agriculture, if you like to call it. So that's aquaculture or mariculture. So top 10 fisheries and aquaculture countries. Again, here you'll see China, both in fisheries and in aquaculture at the top, 150 million tons. 
they produce you know 150 million tons of fish they produce either through capture fishery or through aquaculture um, and obviously they are a great consumer of fish also but they're also a big exporter of fish um, and then you see a sudden jump down if you, if you see indonesia at number two uh, that's 150 for china uh, and indonesia is barely not even 40 million tons you know so there's a there's a huge you know drop there so Ch china is i mean just humongous you know in terms of uh, its fishery I mean, china is humongous in terms of most of its production if you if you if you just out of interest if you just google for anything biggest producer of this that or the other uh, it's quite likely that china is at number one for everything you know uh, just food food production steel production coal production power production uh, solar energy production just name it you know uh, everything uh, china is at number one by a huge margin in many in many cases um, so india is at number three so which is a which is a comfortable good position but but small you know 16 as compared to 150 so there's a tenfold jump there between india and china and then of course you can see uh, so it goes up to vietnam number four number four both but then usa is at number four there number five there but bangladesh is at number five in aquaculture and so on so there's a bit of a mix and match there um, uh, and you can see so so basically you have uh, 10 top fisheries and 10 top aquaculture countries there uh, uh, listed uh, as you can see um right so then then we come to the mineral resources of the sea mineral resource of the sea is uh, i mean they, they are very significant and they have been put they're not that significant actually up until this first world well the first and the second world war but they have become hugely significant as the population has gone, gone up, our consumption patterns have skyrocketed, and and uh, we are we are more and more uh, looking for uh, things that everybody else has, you know. So so as a result of that, uh, the mineral resources exploitation has become a huge business, and it's become like I said, sand and gravel used to be the biggest uh, biggest uh, mineral that was mind at one time it still is one of the biggest sand and gravel business is huge uh, and not just in the sea but also in the rivers so in fact a lot of problems that we face in our uh, in our rivers and in, around us uh, including uh, around pune or including in maharashtra or in india uh, are because of illegal sand mining you must have heard these cases of illegal sand mining the whole time illegal sand and gravel mining because the demand our our uh, our uh, our need for construction material is so tremendous you can go around anywhere in india today or anywhere in the world today and you will see huge amount of construction going on and all of that construction needs is sand and gravel so it's a huge uh, hugely significant mineral that is extracted from the marine environment and also from the terrestrial environment <clears throat> so of course the most common thing of course is salt uh, not 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 an expensive commodity um, relatively easily obtained by just having salt pans, you know, just uh, uh, in the in the mud flats, in the in the in the in the wetlands, you know, just create these uh, salt pans and and let the water evaporate, and then uh, you get your salt, sea salt. Uh, so getting salt uh, has been age-old thing. In fact, we've been getting salt from the sea uh, from the history of mankind. Uh, indeed, uh, there is some sea, uh, some rock salt, as 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 it were, in other parts of the world, including in Famously in Himalayas, you get the pink, pink Himalayan salt uh, from the Himalayan mountain ranges. But anyway, so so salt is uh, essential to us, but uh, also uh, a, a relatively uh, cheap commodity. So salt, potassium, and magnesium these are associated with seawater. So these are these are just a case of chemically or physically purifying, uh, or, uh, or or just getting rid of the other things and getting these uh, extracting, as it were. Of these three uh, of these three elements, but then comes uh, sand and gravel, uh, sand and gravel, or what we call as aggregates or building material, as they are called, um, limestone and gypsum. Again, another building material, a lot of uh, importance. Increasingly, uh, limestone has been traditionally a building material, uh, uh, cementing material, as it were. Uh, also, limestone was used as a cementing material before before cement itself, uh, and gypsum uh, again a material that is used for uh, coating bricks or coating stone and so on. 
of, of creating gypsum boards and so on. So there, there's tremendous demand for that. Uh, then, you have what, then, then you have what we call as uh, um, uh, the placer deposits. Placer deposits are uh, deposits in traces of, uh, of elements that are found in, these are, these are generally heavy metals. These are generally what are called as heavy metals. And uh, they, they, when they get transported by rivers and by, by streams into the sea, uh, they, the flow of the river, as it, the flow slows down, then the sediment starts settling down. And these are heavy metals, so they settle down and those become tracer minerals. Uh, so uh, it's well known that uh, gold is an important uh, placer element, uh, tin. Uh, these are heavy metals, both of them. Uh, in fact, the in, entire the development or the, or the history of the United States uh, is, uh, is based on the placer mining of gold, uh, particularly in the uh, Western United States, so the so-called gold rush. Um, tin uh, uh, or cassiterite, as it is called, uh, that was uh, in Southeast Asia and many other parts of the world. And atomic minerals, India is particularly lucky to have in the beaches of Kerala and Tamil Nadu in the south, uh, atomic minerals, uh, uh, which, are, uh, which are in reasonable uh, quantities and reasonable what you call as assay values or, or reasonable percentage, as it were, reasonable traces. You know. Now, so those are, uh, you know, really sort of minerals that we found in the, in the coastal zone. But now you have something a little bit away uh, from the coastal zone and you have what we call as phosphorite deposits. Um, phosphorites are uh, generally phosphates, you know, uh, you use phosphates for, as fertilizers, fertilizers in, in agriculture. So, for, uh, so we have in fact a, a company, I think in India called uh, Phosphates and Chemicals Limited or something like that. Uh, so, so phosphates are used mainly as fertilizers. Uh, phosphorites are exactly those, and they are uh, they are used as fertilizers. So, so they are mined for that reason. They are mined to, to be used as fertilizers. And of course, the marine phosphorites they are special. They are special uh, because uh, they were apparently found formed as a result of guano bird droppings. You know, you can imagine uh, historic geologically historic times, uh, bird droppings created some of these phosphorite islands. Nauru, uh, a Pacific island being one of them. Nauru is a, uh, is a curious case, actually. New, now again, it's a success has led to its failure, kind of, you know, so that, this interesting story. That Nauru, the island, is formed of guano, bird droppings, and it is that almost entirely, the entire surface of Nauru is phosphorite. So if you... So they, they mined it, obviously. They mined it, and now they find that because, because they have mined it so much that the, the sea level is now almost the level of the island itself. So there's, there's hardly any, any elevated area where people can live or people can survive. So they, they, they are one of the first to, be, to bear the brunt, as it were, of, uh, of climate change or sea level, sea level rise. So, <coughs> but there are phosphorite deposits offshore too. You know, they are found uh, on, the, on the sea floor and they are found in... Uh, ocean mounds, you know. So uh, that is a significant uh, uh, offshore deposit. And increasingly, I mean, the countries that were producing this in high quantities were countries like Morocco. Uh, they are being challenged. They, 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 the economics is being challenged because of these offshore uh, occurrence of phosphorite. Um, then you go further deep, uh, you will you'll get this cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts at around 800,000, 1,500 meters deep, deep of water. You get these cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts. So these are ferromanganese. So essentially, they're ferromanganese. That means iron and manganese. Now, iron and manganese are not that, you know, they're not that much in demand because there's so much iron and manganese on land. Uh, there, are, there are huge iron ore mines and manganese mines even in India. Uh, so that's not the one in demand. The, the demand is for cobalt. Uh, uh, and uh, so cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts are found in, the, in those areas. And these are, of course, these are attached. So these are, they, are, they, are, they are rocks. So they have to be actually broken, physically broken and, and mined if you want to mine them. Uh, although there's no, no mining going on, to my knowledge, of these cobalt-rich manganese crusts. But this is something 
being thought of. They, again, they, they come, depending on where they come, if they come within your exclusive economic zone and within your, uh, within your continental shelf, then they belong to you. If they don't come within your, uh, your exclusive economic zone, so if they're in the, in the area beyond the national jurisdiction, then they come under this organization called the United Nations International Seabed Authority, which is based in Kingston in Jamaica. So that's where the idea of common heritage of mankind and ocean mining, et cetera, is happening. And we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> then you have hydrothermal polymetallic sulfides. I told you about the ring of fire and I told you about plate tectonics and so on yesterday. And, <clears throat> and uh, this hydrothermal polymetallic sulfides, they come because of the hydrothermal activities in these volcanically active zones, hydrothermal activities within the volcanically active zones, and they create polymetallic sulfide deposits of copper, uh, zinc, and so on. So these are polymetallic sulfides, various elements, but again, they, you are more interested in uh, things like copper, zinc, cobalt, and so on, molybdenum, and so on, okay? So those are hydrothermal uh, poly, polymetallic uh, sulfide deposits of, uh, of the sea. And then uh, uh, finally in this list uh, comes uh, what we call as polymetallic manganese nodules. Now this is a very interesting uh, uh, deposit. Now why is it interesting? I was talking to you yesterday about Arvid Pardo. Uh, in fact, um, uh, in fact uh, Antonella mentioned in her introduction and uh, Arvid Pardo, who was the uh, ambassador of Malta, the United Nations. And uh, he made that, and I, I said later on that he made that famous speech in 1967 um, in about, uh, on, the, uh, on the seabed committee of the United Nations. And that sort of spawned, that kind of catapulted into setting up of a seabed committee in 1970. And in 1972, the law of the, 73, sorry, the law of the sea convention was open for negotiations and it uh, reached a conclusion in 1982 9 years later and it was it, it came into force in 1994 uh, four, uh, 12 years later okay so all that happened because of this man uh, arvid pardo and of course as, as i've said our founder elizabeth man borghese uh, was his associate right from the beginning so right from those early years from the 60s. And, uh, and because of uh, their collaboration, they decided to set up the International Ocean Institute in Malta in 1972. But she, uh, she before that, actually, she started what is known as the Pachim in Maribus Conferences in Malta in 1969. So this is uh, a, a sort of, like I said, the journey of the law of the sea, uh, the journey of Arvid Pardo, uh, and the journey of Elizabeth Man Borghese uh, are, are, are intertwined. And so is my journey with Elizabeth Mann Borghese and what I do now through ocean governance. Anyway, so going back to polymetallic nodules, um, those of you who have studied geography or geology will, will know that in, in, the, in the 19th century, in 1862, if I'm not mistaken, 1862 to 1868, something like that, those four or six years um, in the 1860s, there was what is called as a challenger expedition. Challenger expedition was uh, uh, was one of the one of the most exhaustive, one of the most significant oceanographic research uh, expeditions undertaken by the British government. Okay, and this was under the which was on the vessel called the Challenger, and it was headed by uh, uh, Captain Thompson. Charles Wyville Thompson, his name was. So Charles Wyville Thompson was on this vessel for the best part of six years, collecting enormous amounts of samples and sampling the ocean, sampling the ocean for depth, for temperature, for salinity, et cetera, et cetera. But also collecting huge amounts of samples of all sorts of things. In fact, they say that the crates that were brought in to England from these, uh, from these expeditions of Challenger, of those six-year expeditions of Challenger, uh, are so numerous, they're still stored in the Natural History Museum in, 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 in England. And some of them have still not been opened. You know, so there's, there's so many of them. 
So th this is like one of the most meticulous, most, uh, most, uh, most uh, all-encompassing uh, surveys of the ocean carried out. Imagine way back in uh, in the 19th century when when the technology wasn't so much so advanced and so on. So you know, very big credit there. So one of the things that he found was these polymetallic nodules. You know, one of the things that he found was these polymetallic nodules, and these nodules are free freely lying around on the seafloor. They are freely there on the seafloor uh, in what are known as abyssal plains. We talk about abyss, 4,000 meters and around and deeper. So in that depth, they are on the seafloor. They're strewn on the seafloor like potatoes. They're potato-shaped objects, like pebbles. You know, They are like, like potato-shaped, but of course they're black in color. And uh, they are like strewn around, like you, you go to a cape, uh, pebble beach, you know, beach with pebbles, large stones, rounded stones. So it's exactly like that. So they're just on the seafloor spread there. And they are there in huge quantities, in the trillions of tons. Now, a book was written by a mining engineer. So this takes me my mining connection, although I've lost my mining connection almost straight away. But there's a mining engineer called John Merrow, an American, who wrote a book called Mineral Resources of the Sea. So Mineral Resources of the Sea was written back in 1965, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe 62, maybe 65, I think. Okay, it was written in 1965. And John Merrow's book, John Merrow wrote the book called Mineral Resources of the Sea. And Arvid Pardo happened to read it. So, so is the legend that Arvid Pardo happened to read that book. And he thought, wow, this is fantastic. And he was a man who was influenced by the, the, the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi of Antyodai, the last man standing must, must benefit and so on. You know, so was, so was Elizabeth Manborghese. So he thought, and what a fantastic opportunity for the mankind if we say that this resource in the area beyond national jurisdiction is the resource, is the common heritage of mankind. We'll talk about that later on. So this whole idea of common heritage of mankind came as a result of Arvid Pardo's reading the book of Mineral Resource of the Sea about manganese nodules and of course other, other resources also such as cobalt rich manganese crusts and hydrothermal, but the focus was on manganese nodules. And the, the philosophy that this should belong to mankind, and this should belong to what mankind? The, all mankind, but it, again, equitable distribution, you know, that idea of equitable distribution, that the poorer people should get a better share of it, and the richer people should get a smaller share of it, and so on. Of course, things don't happen like that in the real world, but, but that's the idea. That, that was the idea of this common heritage of mankind principle that, that Arvid Pardo talked about and made this long speech on 1st of November 1967 in the United Nations. So, <coughs> one of the reasons I moved into ocean myself was because I graduated in, 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 in 77 and law of the sea was just being negotiated those days. And in the early 80s, everybody was talking about late 70s, early 80s, everybody was talking about ocean mining. And I, you know, I, me as a mining engineer, as a young mining engineer, and a naive one at that, I thought, wow, this is a great area to get in. So I got into ocean, but then I found that mining was not happening anytime soon. So of course, then I got into other areas and I got into resources, I got into management, I got into policy, I got into governance and so on. So that's another story. But mining is still not happening. This United Nations International Seabed Authority uh, is now headed by uh, Michael Lodge, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, he's, uh, in fact, we, we, we went to LSE together, not together at different times, but uh, the same, we did the same program there. And, and he is now uh, trying his best to push ocean mining using the principles of common heritage of mankind, etc., by which the International Seabed Authority is bound by. But of course, there are a lot of uh, controversies there and a lot of problems because obviously this could create another huge pollution in the ocean. Another huge pollution in an area that is hitherto untouched. We have not touched that area so far much. We have not touched it much. We have touched it a little bit, but not much. So anyway, and so, but work has been going on ever since. So, so when I was in India until 1988, I was working then with, uh, um, with metallurgical engineering consultants and I was a consulting engineer, and I used to work with National Institute of Oceanography 
which used to take expeditions. In fact, the expedition that I mentioned to you, where I where I, I had a sip from a pint of uh, pint of uh, seawater seawater, uh, and on a research vessel. That research vessel was exactly for that purpose for collecting samples of manganese nodules in the Indian Ocean, where in fact India has now created, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. India has been allocated by this International Seabed Authority. India has been allocated an area where India can conduct ocean mining. And India is one of the, I think, one of the very few nations, probably one of the four or something, one of the four or six, who have got a national license. There are many other countries who have got what you call commercial licenses through their association with other commercial organizations. But we have got a national license as our own entity, as we by ourselves have got a license to conduct ocean mining in the future. But of course, that future, I don't know when it will be because we were, when, when I was young in the early 80s, we were thinking ocean mining was going to happen tomorrow. Uh, even today, people are saying ocean mining will happen tomorrow. So, you know, it's 40 years hence and 40 years we've been talking about tomorrows. So now, what's the, what's the thing about, the, what, uh, about these polymetallic nodules? They are basically, like I said, uh, 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 predominantly consisting of manganese and iron, same as the ferromanganese crusts. But they have copper, nickel, and cobalt. Copper, nickel, and cobalt in proportions that is way much more than you get in ores in on land. So if you get the, if you go to cobalt mines or uh, iron mine, uh, sorry, nickel or, or copper mines on land, then the percentage you get of copper, nickel, and cobalt in the ore is much less as compared to what you have in the nodules. Now, what makes them commercially viable? They say that if you have 10 kilos, 10 kilos of manganese nodules per one square meter of the seafloor, then they are commercially viable. And the other criteria is that they should, they should have copper, nickel, and cobalt. The combined percentage of that should be 2.5. Okay, combined percentage of copper, nickel, and cobalt should be 2.5, and they should be uh, 10 kilos per square meter. So that is the requirement. So the quantity and the quality, that is that makes it commercially viable, okay? In, given the current metal prices and so on, and given current metal prices are quite low. Okay, so that, that is good. But then the problem is, yes, as, as against ferromanganese crusts, you don't have to dig them out, you don't have to break them, there's no explosives to be used or anything like that. All you need to do is to collect these, collect these pebbles, these, these rounded potato-shaped objects. But to collect them from 4,000 meters deep, it's not easy. And if you collect tons and tons of these, you know, millions of tons of these for commercial purposes, then they have to be processed because otherwise, if you bring them to land, the transport costs will be so enormous and then to process them on land and then the pollution that you generate and the emissions that you create. But if you, if you process them on the, on the sea, then you'll be taking the useful quantity, which is only two and a half percent, and you'll be throwing away nine to seven and 0.5% into the sea, and that will pollute the sea enormously. And that will be mostly uh, particulate matter, and that will clog the breathing systems of most sea creatures in that, in that zone. So there are a lot of problems, and, and apart from all the chemical pollution, et cetera, et cetera, I'm talking only about the particulate uh, matter. And so, so anyway, so that's the, um, to cut a long story short, uh, those are the mineral resources of the sea. And that's the map that shows uh, the general sort of occurrence of mineral resources of the sea. So cobalt crusts in light green, the, the big circle that you see there, that's the cobalt crust. Uh, and then there is occurrence of manganese nodules, uh, which is the darker green. So you can see there's one here. And this is the Indian Ocean area, which belongs to India. Well, not all of it, but there are two identical zones that India has created, one to give to the International Seabed Authority according to the agreement, and one for itself to mine. So that's the, that's the Central Indian Ocean Basin, this is called. This is called the Central Indian Ocean Basin, and which is where uh, I had the opportunity in the 80s to go on research cruises, uh, three of them, actually. 
uh, and then these are i told you about the black smoker and the white smoker chimneys so all the red dots these, these are on the you know if you can see they're all, all on the plate plate edges and um, this is where the hydrothermal deposits are hydrothermal deposits that, that that's where the hydrothermal vents are and that's where the hydrothermal deposits are and they are they, they vary from depths of 800 meters to uh, anything like two to three thousand meters depth, depth. Uh, phosphorites again are sh relatively shallower depths uh, or, or, or even on some islands and uh, the manganese nodules like i said are at four thousand uh, meters or so deep or deeper so there it says here uh, distribution is that uh, so there, there you have uh, the various distribution of uh, again getting see so so having them at 4000 6000 or whatever depths that is not the important thing they are there but how to get them from there and how to get them from there without minimal damage to the marine environment and particularly uh, creating pollution and uh, creating clouds of uh, uh, sedimentary matter. <clears throat> okay. Then we come to uh, energy resources of the sea, and I'm again going to uh, just uh, go through the, the list in a, in a kind of a perfunctory manner. <clears throat> so um, the, the most significant are uh, these, the first three, uh, offshore wind energy, uh, well, it's the same as onshore wind energy, but it's more complicated because you have to construct the same, uh, you know, wind turbines offshore. Anything offshore is more difficult than onshore. Uh, I mean, onshore is difficult enough. You know, these are uh, these uh, uh, these wind turbines have uh, blades which are hugely long, and then you have to have three of those, and they have to be coupled with a uh, with a motor in the center, and then uh, you know they have to be erected on, on a mast. Uh, and that's on land, and that's on on land. It's probably somewhat easier because you can have a foundation, you can pour concrete in it, you can have a mast, and you can have the uh, uh, wind turbine there. But it gets more and more complicated uh, as you go uh, offshore. But some countries are, are doing it very successfully. Uh, uh, in the in in Europe, there are any number of countries that have got just as you see. If you go uh, in the countryside in in India, uh, you will see a uh, and what what you call as, as an array of an array of uh, wind turbines on land, uh, you will see an array of wind turbines in the sea, uh, and uh, uh, they they are they they, they I mean they're, they're quite considerable amount of uh, energy is being produced by those uh, wind energy turbines. In fact, um, off the UK, off England, of uh, uh, to the in the North Sea, uh, there is a huge project now coming up, which is uh, called the Dogger Bank, Dogger Bank uh, Wind Energy Project. Um, and in fact, the work for that is going around where I live, you know, so, uh, in, so the, land, the land side work, that means construction of the, of the, of the turbines and the, the machinery, et cetera, that goes with it, uh, is going around in this, in this stretch of land where I live. And uh, the, 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 the Dogger Bank is considered to be, will, will be, when it is functional, will be the biggest wind energy uh, turbine array in the world, producing up to 33 gigawatts of energy. So that's, that's a huge amount of energy there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so offshore wind energy has got a lot of promise. Uh, there, is, um, there is very little against it apart from then what do you do? Just as you know, if you if you recall, uh, and if you, you you will probably know that since the Second World War, particularly after the 1950s, 1960s, and very particularly after the first oil crisis of 1973, if I'm not mistaken, from that point onwards, we started moving offshore for oil, oil and gas. But then the problem became that we never took care of what we will do with the offshore structures. So now there are thousands of offshore structures weighing millions of tons, and we don't know what to do with them and how to get rid of them. So the same problem will be there with these turbines because see, all any installation has a life. Offshore structures have a life maybe 15, 20, 25 years. Even nuclear power plants, they have a life of 50 years or whatever. You know, so then after that, they have got to be decommissioned. They've got to be demolished and they've got to be gotten rid of. And how do you do that? 
And that's a problem for offshore structures. And this is going to be an even bigger problem because the number of turbines that are coming up in the world, including in the Tauga Bank, where 33 gigawatts of energy is going to be produced, that's going to be a big problem. So things, considerations have to be given to how do you, dis, uh, <clears throat> how do you dis, uh, decommission? How do you decommission these huge installations that you are creating uh, uh, around the world in the offshore region? And again, the amount of uh, pollution that we create, that you will create, and disturbance that you will create in the marine environment as a result of that. Now, wave energy, of course, you know, is is relatively uh, a simple concept, but not easy. Again, nothing is easy in the ocean, uh, in the sea. So, wave energy is basically the waves are going up and down. So, you're using the bobbing of the waves, you know, going up and down of the waves, you're using that to, to put a, some kind of a device there, which will push that device up and down and make that translational motion. You know, this is, this is called a translational motion. This is called a translational motion. Convert that into a rotary movement, root, rotary motion, motion, and convert that, attach that to a, a generator and ele generate electricity. Simple. Simply said than done. Uh, well, easier said than done, as you say. So, and you can have the devices both located on the coast. So, so you can have a device which is located on the coast where the waves come and hit. And when the waves come and hit, there will be an air column, for example, within the device that will move up and down. And that will, as the, as the water pushes it, the air column will get compressed. As the water recedes, then the air compression will be released and that will turn a turbine and that will create electricity. You can also have offshore wave energy devices. That means not on the coast, not attached to the coast, but you can have them offshore and offshore devices will be uh, devices that are just bobbing up and down in the sea, in the ocean. And then the, this up and down movement is translated into a rotary movement locally and converted into electricity. So that's the, uh, again, the, the, these, are, these are simple ideas to talk about. Or in principle, they are simple ideas. But okay, as I said, everything is a big problem in the ocean to do it. But having created the structures, having, create, having, having produced the energy, transporting the energy that becomes a, again a huge problem. Because as, as some of you know, who work in the area of energy, that the energy losses are significant. When you, when you take a uh, you know, transmission line uh, on land with, you know, with whatever, uh, 15 kilowatt or whatever transmission line, the amount of losses that are there, if you see it on, in, a, in a dark night, you will see a glow around that wire, you know, the transmission line. You see a bluish glow around that wire. And that glow is nothing but the, the, the electricity, the, the energy that is being lost to the atmosphere. You know, to the to the air, to the surroundings, and that's what uh, is a problem. So again, carrying this, transporting it from A to B, and the A to B can be quite significant distances, can be hundreds, thousands of kilometers, going from one place to the other. So increasingly, these offshore devices are being considered for using locally within within say small island areas and stuff like that. So so tide. So the next one is tidal energy, which is again close to the close to land and tidal energy is in mostly what we call as bays, small bays or narrow openings uh, or uh, na narrow closures as it were uh, of the ocean into the into the land, narrow uh, encroachment as it were of ocean into the land or sea into the land where the tides take the level of water quite significantly up and down. You know, tides happen and tides are very regular. So unlike wind energy because wind maybe suddenly there might be still air for like whole day and then you will not get any energy whereas tides happen twice a day every day without fail you know they, they just happen every day they, they, they are regulated by the moon we talk of solar energy we, we, we talk a lot of solar energy of course offshore solar energy is also possible but that's the same as uh, same situation as uh, land energy and other problems associated with it but this is tidal energy is lunar energy you know nobody I, I don't think people use that word that's my favorite word I call it lunar energy it is regulated by the moon. So tides are regulated by the moon and tidal energy is regular supply of source of energy. 
So what you can do is either in a shoreline region, that, that means where the river is meeting the sea, what is called as river mouth, okay, in, in geographical terms, where the river is meeting the sea and where the water is coming in on high tide and receding on low tide. Yeah, so that is what the tidal energy would, would do. So if you build a barrage, if you build a barrage, barrage is like a dam. So if you build a barrage across the uh, bay or across the across the estuarine opening, then at high tide, the water will come in. When the water comes in, it turns the turbine. It turns the turbine because of the flow of water. So it will turn the turbine in one direction. And when the water recedes at low tide, the turbine will turn the other direction. So these are called bi-directional turbines. So if you, if you have a barrage with bi-directional turbines, it will produce electricity both when the tide is going in and when the tide is going out. So what is known as the ebb and flow of water. Ebbing is rising tide, flowing is the receding, style, receding tide. So both those occasions, you can get in electricity. And this is, this is generally continuous and it is regular. Regular, you can estimate that this is the amount of electricity I'm going to produce from a uh, from a given tidal uh, tidal energy power plant or you know installation. Then there are others which are uh, some of them are ideas, some of them are in principle, etc. So energy from underwater currents, uh, as we have rivers on land, you know, with with big flows, you know. I think uh, Amazon, for example, is one of the fastest flowing rivers in the world and huge quantity. Similarly, there are underwater rivers. The currents actually form rivers. You, know, you, have, the, you have the hot water current and the cold water current that is you know, regulating our ocean temperature as well as the atmospheric temperature. So those are huge currents. They're like rivers flowing underwater, under the sea, under the ocean. So again, if you, if you, put, a, if you put a turbine there, in, in, put a turbine at a, at a location where these flows are going, they will turn the turbine and that can uh, produce electricity. But again, there'll be deep zones. So again, it might be more useful to use that electricity for offshore structure, uh, oil and gas structure or uh, offshore establishment of some nature. Uh, similarly, there is ocean energy, therm ocean thermal energy conversion, because obviously ocean is cold at the at thousand meters, the ocean will be almost zero degrees centigrade. At the surface layer in the tropical area, it could be a temperatures of 18, 20 degrees, 22 degrees centigrade. So you can run an ammonia cycle by liquefying the ammonia at that temperature, at the lower temperature of water. So you suck in the water, you pump in the water and put it through ammonia turbine and the water gets, uh, so, sorry, the, the cold water uh, cools down the ammonia and liquefies it. So the, it shrinks and then the hot water from the surface then makes it into a gas and that expands it and then that turns the ammonia turbine. And that is ocean thermal energy conversion. Again, the, the depths required for that are at least a thousand meters. So the, the best place to put these kind of devices would be uh, in offshore islands, volcanic islands, particularly atolls as they're called. Uh, so if you have put them in atolls and, and volcanic islands, then you have immediate steep gradient and you can uh, have there. So, so small islands can get supplied uh, from these kind of uh, devices. Similarly, I mean, in fact, a lot of these are useful for so small island countries and artificial islands and artificial, uh, what you call as, um, uh, well, rigs, etc. that are put in. Um, then, of course, there are some other in principle things such as salinity gradient. Uh, so, the, 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 the this, the, the pressure, I mean, you have what we call as osmosis, which is uh, creating, um, so if you have reverse osmosis, you can create fresh water from salt water, which is using electricity, you have to feed in electricity in order to convert the uh, salt water into fresh water. If you reverse the process, if you put in fresh water and convert that into salt water, you can use that salinity gradient and produce electricity. Again, the, these are all kind of, experimental or what we like to call as um, uh, concepts, as it were, than anything else. Then biomass energy is similar to what happens on land. You have bagasse from, for example, sugar cane or whatever, you, you, you uh, convert that into ethanol. 
biomass actually a lot of us mistake biomass by saying that okay biomass can be burned but that's the most inefficient way of uh, creating energy uh, not only because the losses are very high but also uh, the burning creates enormous amounts of uh, co2 uh, in the atmosphere more importantly it also creates enormous amounts of uh, particulate matter pollution and so on so uh, bi biomass energy is generally uh, thought of in terms of converting the biomass into ethanol. So I mentioned uh, last, uh, yesterday, I mentioned uh, seagrass, I mentioned uh, uh, the kelp forest. So those are what you call as prolifically growing uh, ecosystems. So you can use those to convert uh, that into ethanol. But again, ethanol, uh, burning it again, it, it's basically, it's a uh, it's a fossil fuel. I mean, it's like a fossil fuel. No? So it's again going to give out uh, carbon dioxide and so on. So those are, those are uh, problematic things. Then, then you have a very controversial uh, source of energy called methane hydrates. Methane, as you know, CH4 uh, uh, is, a, is a gas and it, it burns. It, it readily burns. It's like natural gas. So me methane hydrates are at, at depth of the ocean. Uh, at very cold temperatures and under high pressures, and they are almost like like frozen ice. There, you know, they are there, and in, in many places there are methane hydrates. And methane hydrates can be, you know, can be drilled and then they can be brought up uh, as as gas. But the the problem with methane is that methane is something like twenty four times more potent as a greenhouse gas. So already we know carbon dioxide is creating havoc. I have, I probably not mentioned this, but uh, in the year 1800, when the industrial revolution was in full swing, uh, the the CO2 parts per million was something of the order of 283. So that's in, in the year 1800. When I was born in the year 1955, that's 155 years later, that 283 had gone to 313 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Now, in my lifetime, I'm 66 now, and in the 66 years since 1955, it's gone from 313 to 418. So that's the amount of carbon dioxide uh, per, per parts per million in the atmosphere today, as compared to 283 back in 1800 or even 313 uh, back when I was born. If something goes wrong with this process of methane hydrates extraction, then you are releasing a, 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 a potentially 24 times more potent greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and could be causing more enormous amounts of global warming than we already are suffering from. So that's a thing there. Then ocean geothermal energy is very interesting uh, because obviously uh, there are hot areas on in the seafloor. Uh, and in fact, there are hot areas that are, uh, immediately below us, some distance, some, uh, some depth away. So you can convert that on land, of course, Prince Charles is famously, uh, apparently famously, uh, Prince Charles of England, he is famously uh, powering his estate through geothermal energy. But uh, that's, that's in, in, his, in, his, in his own area, in his own land. Uh, but this can be done in the ocean also. And I have, in fact, visited uh, uh, in, in the Azores. Uh, in the Azores, uh, in one of the nine islands that I, uh, in fact, I went to three of those, but one of the, the larger, I think, Ponta Delgada. So, so when I went to Punta Delgada, they had a huge uh, ocean geothermal energy power, power station, which was supplying bulk of the energy to the island. So that can be a local source, again, because these are volcanic islands. So they are, you know, the, the, the volcanic activity is near, uh, uh, not too deep. So you can tap that. All you, all you need to do is to drill a hole and uh, pour water into it and the water comes out as steam and then the rest works as a uh, as a as a thermal power station you know just you know running a steam turbine and then of course uh, offshore oil and natural gas i have kept it to the end because uh, it is our uh, our addiction to uh, fossil fuels alongside coal uh, that is causing us the problem that we have in the world today uh, and the problem is not going away we are still addicted to oil and natural gas and we are still addicted to coal. Uh, India uh, produces most of its electricity using coal. Uh, so did China. Uh, so 
uh, there is tremendous dependence on fossil fuels, including oil and natural gas. Uh, and of course, it, it's the same way of producing. And I, I just in the passing, let me mention that the reason there is a clamor for getting this extra continental shelf, you know, uh, claim uh, is because of the present because of the possible presence of oil and gas. Because that extra shelf that is given to you, continental shelf is given to you. That is predominantly uh, what we call a sedimentary rock. And those of you who studied geology and geophysics, etc., geology, geography, they will know that uh, oil and gas is found in sedimentary rocks, in sedimentary rocks. And that is why there is this extra clamor to get uh, uh, an added claim to your, ex to your uh, continental shelf. But that's another story. But offshore oil, oil and gas is uh, equally uh, significant. Uh, and in fact, uh, I would say that, it, 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 I mean, even even now probably it is one of the if you combine the offshore oil and gas industry with the with the oil and gas industry on land it's probably one of the largest industries in the world probably a little bit smaller than leisure and tourism which is the biggest industry apparently anyway so and then finally because I said I did not we will not talk too much about um, about uh, strategic uses uh, but I thought I'll just mention it you, you can't but mention it. Uh, so I just thought I'll mention the largest and the most powerful navies of the world. Uh, and of course, uh, there's two distinctions there because the largest is not necessarily the most powerful. Uh, so here again, you can see China, again, is hugely ahead. Uh, 777 assets, they call them. Assets in the sense of the number of ships of various descriptions, ships and submarines that of various descriptions. So those are called the assets. <clears throat> so they have got 777 ships uh, as compared to the U.S., which got 490, which is significantly less, but USA is the top um, most powerful navy in the world. Uh, Russia is commensurate with its uh, number of assets, and it's the second most powerful. Um, China, which is the, has the most number of assets, is number three, and India, which is ninth on that list, is the fourth most powerful navy in the world. So we've done reasonably well in terms of our Navy. So I wish we did more in terms of our other things, you know, in terms of our um, uh, civilian provinces, merchant Navy, in terms of our fish production, in terms of our aquaculture production, in terms of our uh, uh, pollution activities, in terms of producing, um, you know, chemical minerals and uh, things from the ocean and so on, you know. So. So that is where I wanted to, I think, end today. <coughs> um, and um, thank you very much for listening. And like I have said, I would, I would really appreciate uh, if there are some hands coming up occasionally and asking me questions as I go or stopping me and saying that, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, can you explain it a little more or can you say it a little slowly or whatever, you know, whatever comments you want to make. Uh, but... Uh, what I will do at this point is to uh, hang on, as to is to stop sharing my slides, and perhaps uh, you may wish to ask any questions or make any comments or things like that. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for this informative session and simplifying such a complex topic. Uh, I request the participants, you all can come forward and ask questions, can share your experiences. The floor is open to you. Hi, uh, I have a question. I wanted to know what is gross registered tonnage? Sorry, I didn't get that. Sorry, sorry. Gross registered tonnage? Okay, so so basically, it's the it's the it's the weight of the vessel, you know, it's it's the weight of the vessel without anything on it, empty yeah. vessel. Yeah, it's an empty vessel in the sense it it's got all its fittings on it, but it's the total weight of the vessel, including including all the rooms and uh, you know whatever you might have, you know, toilets, this that and the other, everything all together. And fuel also. Yeah. So generally, as I was saying, generally, if you have a vessel that is 500 uh, tons and more, 
then that is considered to be a ship. Although there's no hard and fast rule like that, but uh, otherwise they, you call them a boat, you know. Uh, and I mean, even if you read what is a ship and what is a boat, uh, they, that's, a, that's a light, rather a light-hearted take on it. And it says that a ship can carry a boat, but a boat can't carry a ship. <laughs> Uh, my other question is, you said you can uh, claim extra continental shelf. Yes. Right. How can one do that and what stops somebody else from doing it? Right. Okay. So that's a very good question. Um, the, the continental shelf, like I said, uh, is, uh, see, the, the whole, whole idea behind this claim of continental shelf was uh, because it was, uh, it was, um, in the in the law of the sea negotiations, some wise people thought that you know the continental the continent belongs to you under the exclusive economic zone, and uh, the continent at that point in 1973 you can imagine that 1973 there was already a lot of exploration and exploitation of oil and gas offshore oil and gas going on there. So people knew that in the continental shelf there is oil and gas. People knew that. Okay. Now they wanted to know that if the continental shelf is beyond. Uh, beyond 200 nautical miles, then that also might have oil and gas. Okay, so what? What? Where does the oil and gas is found? It is found in sedimentary rocks. So what people did was they drilled the sedi drilled the uh, sedimentary rock in their continental shelf and found that yes, there was oil and gas. Then they drilled it further down and they found there was oil and oil and gas in that. So then they thought, okay, good. This this sounds like a good commercial proposition. So then they wanted to find out now how can we claim it, you know, because the law says that 200 nautical miles, you draw a vertical line and wherever it hits the sea bottom, that's the end of your continental shelf, right? So what they said is that they came out with this new idea and they said that this is prolongation of our natural landmass, you know, how? Because when the rivers take, the rivers flow into the sea, they take with them sediments from the land right they take sediments from the land and when they when the river goes into when the river is flowing on land it is it has got a good force because it is shallow relatively shallow and the water flow is quite relatively fast so it is taking all the sediments along it is covering the sediments from the land and putting that as it goes into the sea the flow slows down the depth increases so the sediments start sedimenting down. So when they start sedimenting down, this is historic time. I'm not talking about recent times. I'm talking about geolog geological times. So the sediments settle down, they form sedimentary rock. Then the sedimentary rock gets the formation of oil and gas. Right? So then, this is all geological time. So they are saying that my land was stolen from me by the river and given to the sea. So that land belongs to me or that sediment belongs to me. And that is how countries were given the opportunity. There's, and I'll talk about that later. You know, so you have asked me a question about something that I'm going to talk later. But there is a commission on the limits of continental shelf appointed by the United Nations Conference of the Law of the Sea, the UNCLOS Convention. And that then makes several stipulations as to how you can claim it, how much you can claim it. And if the opposite party, for example, if you are, if you are claiming... Let's say India is claiming um, uh, continental shelf and on the other side, Thailand, you know, which is our nearest neighbor in Southeast Asia. If they are also claiming a continental shelf, then how to uh, equitably distribute them between Thailand and India or between, say, Maldives and India? Okay. If you see what I mean. Does that make sense? Hello? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So going to go over it again, then that will be. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but feel free to you know if, if there's a specific point you want to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You feel free. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Thank you, Shada. Yeah. Uh, I have one more. Uh, thank uh, you. Pipeline and cables that go below the sea, right? For uh, whatever transferring. Yeah and all the, how deep yeah. will they be? They'll be, they are buried generally in the sea. They are buried in the sea. So as deep as the sea floor goes. Which might be unlimited. 
not unlimited because if you take the atlantic you're talking about maybe you know 2 3000 Uh, meters because they are not going to go to the deepest point they they are going to yeah, locate right. they'll take the it from the shallow side yeah and, and they they see what they are doing is they are connecting see they are not connecting uh, antarctica with the cable they are connecting you know uh, our land masses so our land masses are reasonably close to each other in fact if you see india to arabia you know arabian yeah. peninsula or india to southeast asia they are all not 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 that deep that that those, those zones so what they will do is they will find the uh, as shallow zones as possible and you have to actually cut trenches you know okay in the seabed because if you okay. leave the if you leave the pipeline and cable on the sea floor then that can get uh, entangled with uh, ships uh, anchors it can get entangled with uh, entangled with uh, uh, bottom trawling fishing fishing and all of that you know and that can damage the cable or it can damage the uh, vice versa you, you see yes so they have got to be buried they have got to they have to make a submarine trench they have to make trench all along and then they have to get into that then they have to put the cable or pipeline there so it is a it is a it is a big business in fact a good friend of mine from in fact my classmate from iit kharagpur he's worked all his life just doing that laying pipelines and cables any other thoughts questions hello like is there a, like we can put some questions if we remember later or something because you are recording this sure there- see the, the the things what you can do is you can uh, you have got my you got my linkedin connection so you can email me your questions number 1 okay uh, what you can also do is uh, you can you can make a note of your question and you can ask me uh, next day okay. is that okay that's fine thank you okay thank you any 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 further thoughts any further any other participants who want to say something uh so i suppose uh, there are no further questions from any of the participants in case uh, anybody has some queries or can they can ask tomorrow in the next session as well or probably can mail it to you through your linkedin as you have mentioned yeah and you, you got my you got my linkedin uh, contact uh, and uh, my email address is also on the linkedin uh, my mobile number is also on linkedin so you can send me whatsapp messages so contact me through linkedin whatsapp or email yes sir right thank you for the uh, few people who have joined today we can mm-hmm. share the details uh, of sir's linkedin id and the email id on the whatsapp group as well yeah, i can do that i can do that now again if you want uh, Yeah, I'll just do that. <clears throat> yeah, so if you i have sent my linkedin uh, contact so if you join me there you can get my email address and you can also get my uh, mobile number so please feel free to send me an email you can send a message on linkedin itself or you can send a whatsapp message please please uh, refrain from calling uh, but uh, keep it to whatsapp message linkedin message or uh, email thank you Thank you so much sir. Uh 
Because all the participants have already got the link there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I suppose it's when we can wind up the today's session. And okay, thank you. Can... Yeah. I'll see tomorrow. You. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow at same at the same time, and uh, uh, the link will be given by uh, Ter uh, in due course to all of us, and we yes, will sir. we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the participants for being with us today and see Please. you all tomorrow. Same time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.